The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my foundation Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, and by God's grace, episodes to follow, we revisit a popular topic wherein we continue to look at various apparent supposed Bible contradictions presented by atheists, skeptics, and humanists. As before, we will examine them against what the Bible says in context, according to proper exegesis, using the languages in question, correct grammar, the culture of the day, and most importantly, the prism of spiritual discernment given by God to those who truly desire to understand His revelation of Himself and his relationship to man. As a prelude to answering any apparent Bible contradictions, if you as a listener have not done so already, listening to the introductory episode regarding questions about contradictions will be an indispensable prologue to fully understanding, or more importantly, answering any question or apparent contradiction which exists. Therefore, I will have to rely from this point forward on the listener to faithfully adopt the biblical posture of the Berean Bible student who is willing and able to do their own respective homework in order to avoid the pitfalls inherent from failing to do so. In the episodes to date, we have examined and answered 49 questions regarding supposed Bible contradictions from our old friend, Mr. Ash, the atheist, skeptic, and humanist. Beginning in episode 16, we began the double jeopardy phase of really serious Bible contradictions, which constitute a supposed fundamental attack on the Christian message. In this episode, we 
hit a milestone with our 50th question, an apparent contradiction, put forth by Mr. Ash. For our 50th randomly selected serious fundamental attack on the Christian message, an apparent contradiction, we have a special question from Mr. Ash. In this case, the answer to Mr. Ash's question answers not one, but several questions which Mr. Ash typically asks. Normally, we would address one question and one answer. However, the answers and questions involved here are all related to a fundamental misunderstanding and ignorance regarding the fundamental issues already discussed in our introductory episode. While I realize that this has been Mr. Ash's problem to one degree or another with all 50 questions to date, nowhere does the issue become more evident than with the following issue. So, without further ado, Mr. Ash asks, What day was Jesus crucified? Alternately, Mr. Ash's confusion on the matter ultimately causes him to ask the following questions, which are related. Was Jesus crucified before or after the Passover? And finally, was Jesus in the grave for three days or not? In order to construct this supposed contradiction, Mr. Ash cites the following verses. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. Quote, now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Unquote. The next three verses of Matthew, as well as Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 17, and Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 14, go on to make it clear that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper in the upper room before Jesus' crucifixion occurred. Mr. Ash then turns to John chapter 19, verse 31, which says, quote, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that day was a Sabbath day, was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away." Unquote. So, since John is talking about obtaining Jesus' body from the cross, it is clear that Jesus is dead now as a result of the crucifixion. The reason that everyone wanted to dispose of Jesus' body properly was because of the preparation for the Passover, which was future. This causes Mr. Ash to ask, what day was Jesus crucified, and was Jesus crucified before or after the Passover? Any confusion over which day Jesus was crucified would then in turn cause us to question how many days Jesus was in the grave, and whether in fact Jesus was in the tomb for three days or not. So, Let's answer these, and perhaps a few others, along the way. In order to do so, we will need to patiently review some Bible facts which provide a foundation for a correct understanding of the various questions posed by Mr. Ash. Fact 1. The Jewish quote-unquote day. The Jewish day begins in the evening and concludes with the following evening. Genesis chapter 1 verse 5, quote, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day, unquote. Additionally, a Jewish day was not based upon our modern clock, Rather, each day would be based upon the respective sunset and sunrise. The amount of hours and or time within this said period would be relative to the season. As a result, even in, as in our modern times, there would be a different amount of daylight and a shorter or longer day depending on winter, spring, summer, and fall. Our modern day starts at midnight and continues until midnight 24 hours later. 
during the first century, the only clocks were water clocks and or sundials. There were no watches with which to exactly measure the time in a universal method. During Jesus' day, time was measured differently between the Romans and the Jews. When reading the Gospels, care should be taken because sometimes various writers relate events to a primarily Roman or Gentile audience using the Roman method of telling time. In other cases, the writers used the Jewish method for a primarily Jewish audience. Because of the differences in how Jewish, Roman, and or modern time is measured, the quote-unquote time between when a Jewish day slash night begins and ends and when a Roman slash modern day slash night begins and ends will differ. Fact 2. The Jewish quote-unquote month. The Jewish month and the various festivals throughout the Jewish year were determined by the visual observance of the lunar phases. As a consequence, the beginning of each month and the various festivals, including Passover, would be contingent on the Jewish priest's observance of the moon and its appearance month to month and year to year. Our modern Western European celebrations, festivals, and holidays tend to be based upon the Gregorian calendar, which is different from that of the Jewish calendar. Fact 3. The quote-unquote Sabbath. The Sabbath, or literally the day of rest, is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, and gets codified in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. The Sabbath is a weekly observance which generally starts on each Friday in the morning and continues until Saturday evening. During this time period, God commanded that his people rest, as the word Sabbath is translated, and abstain from various forms of work and or labor. Again, because of the time differential mentioned in point number one above, the quote-unquote Sabbath does not exactly match or harmonize with the time period referred to as Saturday. Fact 4. The Jewish Festivals and High Sabbaths Leviticus chapter 23 verses 1 through 44 establishes various festivals during various months throughout the Jewish year. Each of these festivals has its own quote-unquote high day, quote-unquote Sabbaths, or High Sabbath, which is independent of the weekly Sabbath. There are seven High Sabbaths within each Jewish year. The first and seventh days of unleavened bread, Pentecost, trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah in Hebrew, atonement, or Yom Kippur, the first day of tabernacles, Sukkoth, and the last great day. Fact 5. The Passover In first century Judaism, there were five Jewish sects which observed quote-unquote Passover, each with its own distinct days for the sacrifice of their lambs. These Passovers were the Mosaic Passover, the Samaritan's Passover, the Essenes Passover, the Sadducees Passover, and the Pharisaic Passover. According to Leviticus chapter 23, verses 5 through 7, quote, In the first month, on the fourteenth of the month, between the evenings, is the Passover to Jehovah. And on the fifteenth day of this month is the Feast of Unleavened Things to Jehovah. Seven days unleavened things ye do eat, and on the first day ye have a holy convocation, ye do no servile work, unquote. Now, over time, the interpretation of the meaning of the term, quote, at twilight, unquote, changes. Some assume that the, quote, unquote, twilight at the in, is at the end of the day of Nisan the 14th, and others assume that the twilight is at the beginning of Nisan the 14th. 
Therefore, one faction would observe the killing of the Passover lamb at twilight in between the 13th and 14th of Nisan, and another would observe the killing of the lamb at twilight in between the 14th and the 15th of Nisan. In both cases, it is still the 14th, but one is at the beginning of the Jewish day, and one is at the end of the day. Secondly, the Jews were further instructed to cleanse their homes of all leavened bread, and beginning of Nisan the 15th, the Jews were to eat unleavened bread for seven days as they left Egypt. So it is correct to call Nisan the 14th as Passover, or Pesach, while at the same time the Jews can say that Nisan the 15th is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the holiday of Matzach, while at the same time the 15th of Nisan is still within the event referred to as Passover. The fact that Nisan the 15th and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is also called Passover is verified by Luke chapter 22, verse 1. Quote, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Unquote. Now, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the Jews lost their ability to carry out the necessary prescriptions of the sacrificial system required for lambs for Passover and any other propitiatory sacrifices. Thus, moving forward to present, since the tools necessary to celebrate those aspects of Nisan the 14th and the Passover were no longer available, modern Jews began to start the Passover celebration on the 15th. If we align all of these various Jewish cultural considerations into the framework of the Passion Week of Jesus' life and death, we come away with a very different result from that of which Mr. Ash concludes with a Western European understanding devoid of Jewish background. So, let's look at the Passion Week of Christ, do the calculations to determine what days of the week correspond to the Passover, and then correlate that to our Gospel accounts. When we do, as we look at Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 20, Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 17, Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 14, and John chapter 18, verses 28 through chapter 20, verse 2, I believe that the best harmonization of every event places Jesus' crucifixion in the year 30 A.D., Consequently, we see that in that year, Nisan the 14th falls on a Wednesday, which would be the fifth day of the week in that year. According to all four above gospel accounts, Jesus meets with his disciples in the upper room to conduct the Last Supper or Seder to take communion and to celebrate the Passover. During that event, Notice that at no time do we hear of Jesus or anyone else present at the Last Supper slaying, sacrificing, or eating a lamb. The only lamb present, in fact, was Jesus, who was and is the Lamb of God. It is Jesus who institutes communion and offers unleavened bread and wine as the type symbolic of his flesh and blood, which, looking forward, will soon be sacrificed and shed for them and us. Now, to further complicate matters, certain sects, such as the Essenes, kept a slightly different calendar with slightly different dates based upon a different reckoning of the length of a year. As a result... The Essene date for the Passover would be different from the Sadducee and or Pharisee Passover date. As it turns out, if we examine the relationship of both dates during a 20-year period around the presumptive time of Jesus' death, we find that in the year A.D. 30, the Essene Passover falls on Tuesday, Nisan the 13th while the Pharisee Passover falls on Wednesday, Nisan the 14th. Thus it is possible that Jesus attended the Passover meal, 
the Last Supper, or Sadir, in the upper room on Tuesday evening, Nice on the 13th, in keeping with the Essene date for Passover, and was crucified on Wednesday, Nice on the 14th, in keeping with the Pharisee Passover date. Alternately, it is also possible that the differing interpretations of, quote, at twilight, unquote, mentioned above in fact five, could explain the confusion over the timing of the Passover. In either scenario, Jesus could have celebrated the Passover Seder meal, the Last Supper, on the evening of Tuesday Nice on the 13th, and then later been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and his trials began. On Wednesday, during the day, Jesus could be delivered to Pilate, and approaching the sixth hour, which would be about 3 o'clock p.m., Pilate would deliver Jesus for his crucifixion. It is here we read John chapter 19, verse 4, which says, quote, And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king, quote. We are at this point on Nisan the 14th by the reckoning of the Jewish day. According to Flavius Josephus, the Passover lambs were slain on Nisan the 14th, the preparation day, outside the walls of the city between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock p.m. Then, after sundown, they roast them at home for the Passover. Therefore, Jesus, the Lamb of God, died outside the walls of the city at three o'clock in the afternoon, the Jewish ninth hour, precisely at the time that the traditional Jewish sacrifices prescribed by God were to commence. According to Matthew chapter 27 verses 25 and 26, Mark chapter 15 verse 33 and 34, and Luke chapter 23 verse 44, Jesus was now on the cross being crucified and darkness fell from the 6th, i.e. 3 o'clock p.m. to the 9th hour, i.e. 6 o'clock p.m. At around the 9th hour, 6 o'clock p.m., Jesus died. So, at this point, the Jews would have slain the Paschal Lamb for the traditional Passover at the same time that Jesus, the Lamb of God, sacrificed himself as a propitiation for his people. At this point, we are approaching the evening of Thursday, and consequently the 15th of Nisan will begin, which signals the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. As stated, the Feast of Unleavened Bread would be considered a High Sabbath. It is at this time, sometime between the ninth hour, i.e. 6 o'clock p.m., and sundown, that we read the following verses. John chapter 19, verse 31. Quote, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away, unquote. Also, Mark chapter 15, verse 42, quote, And now, when the even was come, because it was the preparation that day before the Sabbath, unquote. And Luke chapter 23, verse 54, quote, And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on, unquote. We can see here, reading these verses, where Mr. Ash and, and even many Christians begin to get confused because Mr. Ash is not aware of the High Sabbath, which occurs in the evening beginning Nisan the 15th, and thus assumes that the writers are referring to the weekly Sabbath, which starts in the evening on Friday and continues until Saturday evening. In any case, Jesus' body is placed inside the tomb sometime on Nisan the 14th between 6 o'clock p.m. and sundown. But, because of the unnecessary confusion on the high Sabbath versus the weekly Sabbath, readers incorrectly assume that Jesus' body was placed in the tomb between 6 o'clock p.m. and sundown on Friday. As a consequence, we have 
readers then assuming that Jesus was crucified on Friday and then later entombed, giving rise to the event erroneously being called, quote, Good Friday, unquote, a misnomer which persists to this day. However, as stated, Jesus was crucified and entombed on Wednesday, Nice on the 14th, between 6 o'clock p.m. and evening, which was the beginning of the 15th, a high Sabbath in keeping with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On Thursday, Nice on the 15th, Jesus' tomb is sealed and a guard is placed on it. At evening on Friday, the weekly Sabbath begins and continues until Saturday evening on Nice on the 17th. Sometime between Nice on the 17th, after the evening, and Sunday, Nice on the 18th, which would be the first day of the week, Jesus resurrects from the dead. Afterwards, the women come to the tomb in order to anoint Jesus and discover the tomb empty. Jesus then announces himself to Mary and later to the disciples as having risen again. Having addressed clarified and resolved the supposed contradiction regarding whether Jesus was crucified before or after the Passover, and what day Jesus was crucified, we turn our attention to whether Jesus was in the grave for three days and nights or not. In this case, Mr. Ash typically sets the stage for his supposed contradiction based upon Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, which says, quote, for as Jonas was in three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Unquote. Variations of Jesus' prophecy are repeated by all four gospel writers, with Matthew having the greatest specificity. Having cited one or more of these, Mr. Ash will then turn to the same arguments and issues which have already been visited regarding various confusions over when the Jewish day starts, the lunar month, the Sabbath, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the High Sabbath, etc. And ultimately, Mr. Ashton uses the errant mistake made by many, including some Christians, that Jesus was crucified in the year 33 AD and died on Friday, Nisan the 14th, at around 6 o'clock p.m., Mr. Ash then proceeds to count the days that Jesus was in the grave as follows. Friday, Nisan the 14th, to Saturday, Nisan the 15th, is one day and one night. Saturday, Nisan the 15th, to Sunday, Nisan the 16th, is one day and one night. When Mr. Ash does the math according to this scenario, he comes up with a total of Jesus being in the grave for two nights and two days. Consequently, if we use the erroneous day of Friday, i.e. Good Friday, as the day Jesus was supposedly crucified and buried, one has to use some very creative math to get beyond Jesus being in the grave for more than two days and two nights. Now, if we instead use the corrected information presented above, we find the following regarding how much time Jesus spent in the grave. Wednesday, Nice on the 14th to Thursday, Nice on the 15th is one day and one night. Thursday, Nice on the 15th to Friday, Nice on the 16th is one day and one night. Friday, Nice on the 16th to Saturday, Nice on the 17th is one day and one night. When we use this corrected information discussed before, we come up with Jesus being in the grave three days and three nights exactly as predicted. Additionally, as stated, the evening until midnight is the beginning of the Jewish day. Therefore, as Saturday, Nisan the 17th, is ending at evening until midnight. The next day, Sunday, Nisan the 18th, is just beginning. Sunday would also be considered the first day of the week. This timing agrees with all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, discussing Jesus' resurrection. John chapter 20, verse 1, gives the best account. Quote, The first day of the week 
Sunday cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Unquote. Clearly, if the stone is taken away from the sepulcher of Jesus' tomb, and Luke's account tells us that Jesus' body was missing, then Jesus had to have resurrected sometime from Saturday, Nisan the 17th, from evening to midnight. We then have the misunderstanding that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday since all four gospel accounts have various people arriving around sunrise while still dark only to find Jesus already risen. But an empty tomb is not the same as an actual resurrection which had clearly already occurred. Lastly, traditions, however old and venerated, are not the basis for contradictions to what God's Word actually says. All told, when we survey the corrected information on when the Jewish day starts, the lunar month, the Sabbath, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the High Sabbath, as well as how the days are then counted regarding how long Jesus was in the grave, we see that all three of Mr. Ash's supposed contradictions have been answered and debunked. We see, once again, using a proper biblical world and life view, that there are no contradictions here, no fundamental assaults which destroy the Christian message. There is only an inability or unwillingness for Mr. Ashe to understand what the basic message of the gospel is, along with the unregenerate mind of Mr. Ashe, who must at all costs deny God in order to justify himself. In all, to date, in this series, we have, in each case, serious questions posed by various individuals who hold themselves out to be scholars, critical thinkers, intellectuals, and the like, who collectively fall in the pseudonym of Mr. Ash. These and others are questions which individually and collectively serve as the basis by which we are intended to come to the conclusion that the Bible is not God's Word, but rather a collection of myths and fables only to be believed by the simple-minded and the gullible. However, in truth, these fifty and a myriad remaining others are nothing more than apparent contradictions which exist and remain largely, if not exclusively, due in fact to Mr. Ash's inability or unwillingness to do his research coupled with his unwillingness to open his mind and heart to God and his word. This concludes this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com Thank you for listening. The world falls around the iris I know that He has found me Christ the rock is my foundation I will trust in Him I will trust in Trust